How many of us have goals, intentions, and dreams that we're working towards? I'm sure we all have something we're working towards or hope to gain. I remember when I made the New Year video for 2024. I mentioned writing your intentions down and creating action items that will position you towards your intention or goal. When we make plans, the only way we'll see them manifest is by taking action and actually doing the work it takes to get there. What if you had a goal in mind, but it involved unknowingly trading your life or walking into unknown territory, leaving your loved ones with unanswered questions and bizarre mystery? Well, on Thursday, July 23rd, 2020, somewhere along a nearly 2,000 mile road trip that appeared to be a spur of the moment trip of hopes, dreams, and what seems to be a puzzling mystery. 28-year-old Devontae Richardson left his home in Washington, D.C. to Wyoming to see a friend with what seemed to be a trip to pursue something or a meeting to gain some form of relationship. We know he was in the process of building his business. He had the skill and was set to go far in his newfound career choice. A talent that he had, but something went terribly wrong. The odd text. The particular person he was alleged to have been attempting to go see, which is a renowned artist in today's popular culture. The tweets, an unconfirmed witness statement of a mysterious woman at a gas station, and then everything just suddenly went dark. All communication just stopped. Nothing. Until just days later, his 2016 Jeep appeared in a remote location nearly 30 hours from his home in the nation's capital, but only 12 miles from the artist's property. The oddity about this case is the fact that there is no trace of Devante, a nearly 2,000 mile trip with no trace. Devante went missing when the country was in a pandemic, full of confusion and uncertainty. His last moments in DC are questionable, and most prominently, the trip itself and thereafter. Why was he seeing this person? Who was he speaking to prior to his departure? And where is he today? So what happened to Devontae Richardson sometime between July 23rd through the 27th? Someone had to have seen or encountered him. Could this be a case of catfishing? A chasing of a dream that turned grim? A manic episode? Or was he really headed to see recording artist, Kanye West, his friend, and then something happened. We're going to discuss the case details and all of what has been shared publicly, delve into the spotty timeline, analyze every detail in our case breakdown, discuss my own findings, then close with my opinion. A case like this just can't be swept under the rug, but it seems it already has. A case so cold that it's almost forgotten, but I can't let that happen. This is the Missing Found Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Harlow. Before we get into the case, I have a few details to share about the show. The Missing Found is an investigative true crime podcast focusing mainly on unsolved missing person cases in the Black community. The cases that I cover have either gone cold, have little to no media coverage, or have gone without conclusion. You can follow the show on Instagram at The Missing Found or on Medium at The Missing Found to read our original script. I also would like to mention that we have a case suggestion form in the show notes or description box that you can complete to submit your case suggestions that are of the Black and Missing. We have a Patreon that's now available for you to become a member in our private community to discuss cases deeper beyond our case analyses through private discussions with me, ad-free episodes, early releases, and much more that's exclusive for members only. The show is also available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. For Apple Podcasts, we ask that you give us a five-star rating to help the show reach a broader audience, to help find our missing. To access all things of The Missing Found, you can visit our website, themissingfound.com. I ask that you please like, share, comment your thoughts on this case, and subscribe if you found value and want to continue the journey with me to finding our missing and learning about their stories. This is case episode 22, The Disappearance of Devontae Richardson.
So who was Devante? Devante Marquez Richardson was born on Tuesday, June 9, 1992 in Washington, D.C. Devante grew up in D.C. and lived with his mother for most of his younger years up until early teenhood. At age 13, his mother, Miss Alicia Harvey, has sent Devante to live with his father in Missouri to help with discipline. While in Missouri, he was productive and attended college, has spent some time in Memphis, Tennessee, and eventually came back home to D.C. with his maternal family and got started in the workforce. Devante was described as being a creative, loves his family, and seemed to have a normal and stable relationship with family and friends, and even maintained his friendship with some of his college mates back in Missouri. On the Intrigued Full Effect podcast, hosted by TV news veteran and journalist Chandrea Thomas, Devante's aunt, Marquita, described him as being quiet and he pretty much kept to himself. Devante was said to not have been big into social media, but started off using it casually like many of us do. However, as we progress into the case, you will find that though he was not an avid user of social media, he did leave a digital footprint that may give insight and share his last public interactions. Devante was a hard worker. He excelled at his job at Shoppers, a local grocery store that's prominent in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. He did so well that he progressed from being on the floor to a managerial position. Just only three months into the new year, in March 2020, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic due to the COVID-19 virus taking a powerful hit on the world. As you all know, that's when total transformation came for all of us. Devante was laid off from his job due to shoppers closing. This particular grocer, owned by United Natural Foods, had planned on closing multiple locations starting in January 2020 across the DMV area, prior to the pandemic. This mass closure may not have been fully due to the pandemic, but because the shoppers brand was being sold to a different owner. There are still some shoppers' locations that are still in operation. Because Devante was an employee who was laid off that made him eligible to receive unemployment benefits in the state or district in which he worked, just as millions of other Americans who qualify for unemployment insurance benefits if they were an employee, or Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, or PUA, which were curated for self-employed individuals, gig workers, and independent contractors. Throughout this time, he was able to hone in on other talents he possessed and collect his unemployment benefits. Some of Devante's talents were tattooing. He produced beats, which are actually pretty good. I gave it a listen. And has skill in graphics and digital multimedia design. He was truly an artist. He was so committed to his work that he was in the process of making it a business. Big Blue Studio, which launched on June 9, 2020 a little over a month before Devante went missing. He was going by the name Blue Theory, which was also another social media handle that he used on his YouTube and Twitter accounts. Now, it's not exactly clear how long he used this pseudonym and if it was before or after he started his business. Devante had a website, made his social media accounts, logo, had a digital flyer with his graphic design service offerings, and advertised his beats publicly on SoundCloud and Beat Stars, an audio streaming service in a marketplace to sell, license, and give away beats. Big Blue Studio was in its infancy stage, but in the process of reaching new heights. Throughout this process, and even before, Devante even found inspiration from other artists, specifically one being rapper, songwriter, and fashion designer, Kanye West, who also goes by Ye. As you can see, Devante did not allow a job loss and the circumstance of the pandemic to be his end, but used it as a stepping stool to push towards his dreams and aspirations. With a small but massive piece of Devante's digital footprint, his public artistry through music, the social media posts, tweets, the odd videos he posted hours to minutes before embarking on his trip, and the possible connection I made that may suggest some form of new beginning or financial stability. It lets us in on his state of mind, possibly hours to minutes before his trip. So let's delve into the case details. The perfect storm. On Thursday, July 23rd, 2020, there was a bad storm in the DC area. 
It was cloudy all morning and afternoon. Then around 7 p.m., there was some thunder. Around 40 minutes later, it then began to rain on top of the existing weather conditions. Around 8.45 p.m., the light rain then transitioned to a heavy thunderstorm. During this time, the heavy storms coupled with the wind had knocked the power out. These weather conditions progressed into the early morning of Friday, July 24th. According to Ms. Harvey, Devontae's mother, she stated during her interview on the Ikid Mail YouTube channel, sometime throughout the duration of the storm, she had texted Devontae because he wasn't home and asked was he coming in, and he replied that he was all right. This text was Ms. Harvey reaching out to see if Devontae would be coming home due to the inclement weather. Soon after, the power was knocked out and she communicated this to Devontae. He then texts his mother to check on her at around 3 a.m. on Friday, July 24th, and she informed him that the power was back on. Ms. Harvey texts Devontae later in the day and asks was he okay since he did not come home. Devontae replied that he was okay. Ms. Harvey had asked where he was, and Devontae replied that he is going to see Kanye. Ms. Harvey replied and said, quote, who the hell is that? End quote. She stated that was the first thing that came to mind, and most likely she never would have thought it was Kanye West that he was referencing when he replied Kanye. After Ms. Harvey's last text, there was no text back from Devontae. The trip of a lifetime. Ms. Harvey communicated that though he may not have texted her back, he was either speaking to or texting a college friend that he had back in Missouri, and the friend eventually lost contact with him. Prior to losing contact, according to Ms. Harvey, from information that she received from her sister, Marquita, who has been the family spokesperson, the friend stated that he told Devontae to contact him when he gets to where he is going, and Devontae mentioned that he was getting gas. After that, the friend never heard back, nor he stated where he was getting gas from. Devontae was reported missing on Monday, July 27th to the Metropolitan Police Department in D.C., Ms. Harvey recounts. She mentioned that her sister, Marquita, is the one who contacted the police. Law enforcement arrived at the home, performed a search within the home, and they took a report. Devontae was last seen by his grandfather, who has since passed away, and his cousin, Marquita's daughter. They claimed they saw him leave with a black bag, entered into his navy blue 2016 Jeep Compass, and he told Marquita's daughter that he would be back, but he did not state where he was going or when he would be returning. No one noticed any clothing missing. Just the clothes he was wearing and the black bag which was assumed to have been his laptop and other equipment. As for the contents in the black bag, we don't know what was in it. The clothing items that Devontae was said to have been wearing are a blue shirt, gray sweatpants, multicolored New Balance sneakers, prescription sunglasses, and a blue do-rag. I want you to remember these clothing pieces because it will come up again in my case breakdown. At this time, Devontae was officially listed as a missing person in D.C. The search efforts. The family performed their own search within their community to see if they saw his Jeep. They went to Devontae's old job, rode around the neighborhood, and found nothing. Marquita mentioned that her daughter Googled his phone number to see if anything pulled up regarding his location which led them to Glen Burnie, Maryland. Glen Burnie is in Anne Arundel County, which is closer to Baltimore and 45 to 50 minutes from D.C. They drove to Glen Burnie and found no trace of Devontae, nor any evidence to say he was there. Though the family did do their own search, it left them at a dead end. I want to also mention that Googling a phone number will never give someone's location. What they most likely found was the location where the phone number was registered and where the phone number originated. And this could be a different city than what you live in. This is common. The search most likely did not stay in the DMV area because it was found out that he was traveling interstate. This is where things get convoluted because you're now dealing with a search that expands several states and different jurisdictions. The 2,000 mile, 30 hour odd discovery. On Monday, July 27, there was a discovery in an off-road and desolate area close to 2,000 miles from his home in D.C. Devontae's Jeep was found five miles outside of the town of Grable, Wyoming, 
but within Bighorn County limits. In an off-road remote area that is primarily used for mine trucks to pass through and used to haul bentonite for processing. To give you context on the driving distance from D.C. to Grable, Wyoming, it's an approximate 30-hour drive. As you can imagine, this is not a trip one can or, at the very least, should take on their own. The actual location of his vehicle was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. However, according to Angela Lassiter, a missing persons advocate that's local to the area of Grable, Wyoming, and has been a resident for most, if not all, of her life, she stated on the Ikit Mail YouTube channel that Devontae's vehicle was found near a fork in the road on one of the mine roads. Angela has been in contact with D.C., which she claimed it took several weeks to hear back, and she has been in contact with the Richardson family. The Jeep was found not too far from the bentonite plant, in my Swaco, and along the mine hall roads, which are primarily dirt roads. The location is not an area you would access if you're just visiting, but it can if you get lost. Lost far beyond town. Many locals know of the roads because some use them to get to work at the plant or just from being familiar with the area. It's not a common area for visitors to frequent or access. The person who reported the Jeep was by someone whose identity has not been publicly shared and found it on their way to work. This person called the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office and reported the vehicle. The reason this stuck out to the person is because it's a typical for a vehicle to be left unattended on the mine roads since it's primarily designed for mine trucks to access, and a vehicle can cause interruption in the flow of mine traffic. The vehicle was also positioned on the wrong side of traffic. Another major element that stuck out to this individual was that the vehicle had DC license plates. So that's another reason it had prompted the person to contact the sheriff's office. When the vehicle was sighted by law enforcement, they did not notice any footprints surrounding the vehicle, according to Angela. Now let's rest on that for a moment. I thought this was an interesting mention because there not being any footsteps visible surrounding the vehicle is unusual. You would think because we know at some point someone had to exit the vehicle, whether it could have been Devante or someone else who was in or driving his Jeep. I did some research on bentonite soil to understand the material. I came across a great deal of information. Bentonite is natural soil, but when wet, it can create a clay and tend to clump together. But no mention on if prints in the material from hands or feet are left there for an extended time or not. The way Angela said this gave me the impression that bentonite tends to leave prints behind for an extended period of time, which there weren't any footprints. Her comment was specific, but it was not elaborated on further on this particular expression. I don't know if there's more there that needs to be considered or just a red herring. What we know is that someone had to exit the Jeep at some point. Whether someone walked up to the Jeep and pulled Devante out or he got out of the vehicle on his own, footprints would naturally be there. What we don't know is when someone exited and who. Lastly, we also have to consider that the Jeep could have been brought there and not driven there. This is something that I've considered, but I think it's least likely. I think it's least likely because someone would have had to enter the Jeep, drive it on the flatbed, or hook it up to a truck to deliver the vehicle to this spot. I think that's an excessive amount of work to pull off a crime as this, if there is even a crime that took place. The oddity with this is that there were said to be no fingerprints in the vehicle except for Devante's. I found this to be interesting and convenient. The Contents there were a few items left in Devontae's 2016 Jeep Compass, which were his laptop, two cell phones, and the keys in the ignition. This was all that was reported to have been inside of the vehicle. I do find it odd that nothing else was said to be in the vehicle, and I will discuss this in the case breakdown. This is where we're left with four years of mystery. The Timeline I have to admit, I came across some flaws with the timeline because family says one thing, articles state another, Angela says something else, and the missing person flyers say otherwise. Before we progress in the analysis, I want to discuss the timeline so we can analyze the known events that came before Devante being reported missing to understand his frame of mind, the events that took place, and recap where we're left with mystery. 
I'm going off of the timeline that Marquita provided in Devante's social media activity. I'm using her timeline since she was involved in the initial reporting of Devante very early into the investigation. On Thursday, May 14th, 2020, Devante makes a tweet that introduces his social media audience about the euphoria of music. On Saturday, May 16th, he mentions that he is working on his website and that it will launch soon. Throughout the remainder of May 2020, he makes a series of retweets. The retweets seem to be more about self-improvement, goals, Kanye West, and mental health. On Tuesday, May 26, Devante makes a tweet from his business page, Big Blue Studio, that informs his digital audience that his website will launch on June 1st. On Saturday, May 30th, he mentions that the site launch will be extended to June 9th, his 28th birthday. On Tuesday, June 9th, 2020, Devante's website launches to the public, and he posts his flyer to advertise his multimedia digital design services and beats that he produced at BigBlueStudio.com. On Tuesday, June 30th, Devante referenced the Pop Smoke album cover that went viral, designed by the late Virgil Abloh. I mentioned this because it shows how involved he was in music and graphics. July 2020. Between Friday, July 17th through Thursday, July 23rd, Devante released a series of beats on BeatStars.com. On Wednesday, July 22nd, in a now-deleted tweet, Devante tweeted Kanye West, which stated, quote, can they meet me halfway, end quote. Kanye never responded to the tweet. On Thursday, July 23rd, Devante made a video short that was posted to YouTube. In the video, he wished his father a happy birthday, mentioned that he will be working on another beat, which is seen in the reflection of his glasses, and that he will be going to check on his friend, Kanye. The timestamp of this video has not been confirmed. On the same day, Devante texts his father to wish him a happy birthday from a different phone number. This was later confirmed to be Devante's new number. Later, Devante left out of his home that afternoon, told his cousin that he would be back. His grandfather saw him enter his Jeep and leave. On that same day, in that evening, there was a bad storm in D.C. and surrounding areas. Devante's mother texts him to check on him with the assumption that he was still in D.C. On the next day, Friday, July 24th, Devante's mother texts him around 3 a.m. to inform him that the lights were back on. Later on that day, around 1 p.m., was the last contact with his mother via text. He mentioned that he was going to see his friend, Kanye. Mom had asked him who was that, and she never received a response from Devante. Still on July 24th, Devante's friend texts him to see if he made it to his destination. The friend said that he told him that he was getting gas. The friend told Devante to let him know when he get to his destination, but he never received a text back. It is unclear exactly which gas station he was at, nor the state he was in at this time. On Monday, July 27th, his mother notified her sister, Marquita, to let her know that she has not heard from Devante. Marquita calls around to local hospitals and other family members to see if they knew anything. This is also around the time when they did their own search. On that same day, Devante was reported missing by family around 5.36 p.m. Eastern Time. Devante's car was located on a mine hall road right outside of Graybull, Wyoming, near the M.I. Swico bentonite plant. Two days later, on July 29th, the vehicle was reported abandoned. Bighorn County, Wyoming investigators made the connection with MPD in D.C. and found that the vehicle belonged to 28-year-old missing Devontae Richardson. So the case breakdown. I feel like after watching countless hours of interviews, then replaying them to be able to pull information to match up with what has been presented, I've noticed that there are some inconsistencies from all angles. The inconsistencies stem from the date he left D.C., the date he was actually reported missing, and then when his car was found. Every verified article I've read, even the FBI missing persons flyer seems to have it incorrect. How? I don't know. 
I've seen this before, so I'm not surprised. To help you understand the case more, we would need to analyze every element to piece this together, identify the holes and the many questions that I have, and I know you have. We can be 90% sure that Devontae did make it to Wyoming, but the other 10% is I'm unsure if he drove his vehicle to that location. Let's start from the social media angle, since this is where we hear directly from the mind of Devontae and what he had going on in his last moments on public record. The digital footprint tells all. Devontae was active on social media, but he didn't have a large following. In fact, he had a very small following. We have to remember that he not too long ago before lost his job. The country was facing some issues with mass job loss, the state of the country with being on lockdown. And we don't know if, you know, he too was dealing with COVID, symptomatic or asymptomatic. Social media consumption was at an all-time high during COVID due to the state of the country. I cannot confirm if both his personal and business accounts were his only accounts across Twitter, now known as X, and Instagram. His Instagram account was started in May 2020, two months before he went missing. His YouTube account was started on July 16, 2020, seven days before his trip, but his Twitter account had been up since August 2014. The only tweets that exist today are tweets from May 2020 up until the day he left his home on Thursday, July 23rd. The tweets were a mix of retweets with his own tweets that centered around mental health, self-improvement, and music. Either he never used his Twitter account when he created it back in 2014, or he deleted every tweet he's ever tweeted at some point, then started anew in May 2020. We also don't know if someone else had access to his Twitter and deleted all of his old tweets. That's just something only Devante would know and those who had digital contact with him in 2014 and between. That's six years of missing tweets. Sure, there could be absolutely no relevancy there. From what I've gathered, we can get an idea of what was going on with Devante in the last few months of him leaving, his state of mind, what he was doing, and some of his thoughts. To me, he seemed to have been spending quite a lot of time on the internet, as a lot of us were during the pandemic. I mean, we can say this is because he was building his business. He was trying to find ways to make money. He was building his website, making beats, and he acquired Kanye's address to his Wyoming ranch. Devante was a creative. We learned that from his mother and aunt that while he was out of work, he would do tattoos and focus on his music. At the time, they didn't know how involved he was into music. I thought this was interesting because music seemed like a large part of his life. This is only based on what he communicated online. As mentioned, he took an interest in entrepreneurship by starting his own multimedia and digital service business, Big Blue Studio. He used social media to promote his service offerings, love for music and fandom for Kanye West. There is no surprise there because many people were starting businesses to help supplement lost income. One tweet that stuck out was one that he made on Tuesday, July 21st at 2.50 p.m. He tweeted, Slurricane for the brain. Slurricane is an indica marijuana strain made by crossing doozy doos with purple punch. Here's another element I want us to look into further. Doozy doos is an indica dominant cannabis strain. It gives a short burst of energy and then transitions you into deep relaxation. As for Purple Punch, it's a euphoric and relaxing indica-dominant strain that also offers relaxation and sedation effects. I've never used marijuana, but this sounds like the ultimate high with the mix of high energy that brings you back down to a more restful state. This tweet made by Devante does not verify that he was using this drug, but he did make a reference to it. Though not proven, but based on his mention, he could have been using drugs 48 hours before his cross-country trip. Again, we don't know if he actually used the drug or what the drug was, what was in it, and how soon before he used it prior to his nearly 30-hour road trip. In D.C., marijuana usage is legal on private property. This element makes you question what the motivation was for this trip. When you look at the characteristics of the drug, slurricane, you can't help but question if he was using this drug prior to his trip. 
and then taking a nearly 30 hour road trip. In my opinion, it is unlikely. The drug brings you up, then brings you down. I don't see how he would be able to take such long drive under such high by himself with the transition of time zones, weather, and through the day and night. We know that marijuana affects every person differently and often mixed with other ingredients that evoke different effects. Again, this is a statement made by Devante, but we have no evidence to know exactly what all he consumed. With that, I don't think he was on drugs taking this trip. He may have engaged in usage days before, gathered from his Twitter account. However, we have no factual supporting evidence to this. We have something in common, the Kanye connection. There was a tweet that has since been deleted, as I've already mentioned. The tweet was made on Wednesday, July 22nd to Kanye West. The tweet stated, quote, can they meet me halfway, end quote. The tweet was never responded to by Kanye nor any member of his camp. This was 24 hours or less from the day he left D.C. That's a mystery. The tweet that Devante responded to where he tweeted Kanye was during the time Kanye was making a series of intense tweets. According to the Sun publication, the tweets were regarding claims of him been trying to divorce his then-wife, Kim Kardashian. Referring to Kris Jenner, Kim Kardashian's mother, as a white supremacist, and shared a private moment where Kim was allegedly considering aborting their firstborn. Media portrayed this as a serious bipolar episode, according to the Scotsman. Two tweets made from Kanye's Twitter account stated, quote, Chris and Kim put out a statement without my approval. That's not what a wife should do. White supremacy, end quote. Another one stated, quote, I've been trying to divorce Kim since she met Meek at the Waldorf for prison reform, end quote. This was also in close proximity of him running for presidency and has spearheaded his campaign in North Charleston, South Carolina. He was in North Charleston on Sunday, July 19th, four days before Devontae leaves D.C. The reason I bring this up is because Kanye was heavily mentioned in the media at that time and was said to have been experiencing bipolar episodes. The correlation some have alluded to as Devontae finding something in common with Kanye and he felt he needed to check on his quote-unquote friend. The reason this was alluded to because of his tweets, some felt that he was going through something. According to Ms. Harvey, Devontae's girlfriend, or ex-girlfriend at the time, has stated that Devontae was depressed before he left D.C. Now, this is unconfirmed. Now, I don't know what to think of this, because we know Devontae was in the process of new beginnings with his music and digital multimedia studio. We don't know what sparked something into Devontae to want to go visit Kanye. I can only assume that because of what was going on, what some deemed as a manic episode, which could be the cause of Devante breaking his regular routine to take this trip. What his routine was, we, we don't know. Now let's analyze this element a little further. Devante made two YouTube short videos on Thursday, July 23rd. Video one mentioned that he was about to make one more beat. It was also his father's birthday and he was going to check on Kanye. Video two mentioned that he was about to upload the beat, assumingly the one he just created, and getting ready to see Kanye. The videos are odd, in my opinion, because he is wearing sunglasses, a mask, and a do-rag, fully covered. He is dressed in all blue attire because it fits the theme of his brand and what he refers to himself as, Blue Theory. Now let's look at video one. What's up, y'all? Blue Theory here. Today is July 23rd. Oh, also my father's birthday. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday. But, yeah. I'm about to make one more beat. I've probably seen it in the glasses, but I'm make one more beat, and then I'm going to go check on Kanye. Yes. Check on my friend Kanye. So we got some talking to do. I know it may be difficult to hear what exactly is being said in the short video, but it's Devante saying, quote, what's up y'all? It's Blue Theory here. Today is July 23rd. Oh, also my father's birthday. Happy birthday. But yeah, about to make one more beat. You can probably see in the glasses. About to make one more beat, then go check on Kanye. 
check on my friend Kanye, end quote. This video is interesting because it's almost as if he is making a mini vlog at the start of his trip, a trip that he does not publicly mention of taking. This may have been something that he wanted to get into because he was just starting his business and he was trying to make something work. For all we know, he could have had several other videos on his phone or devices that we don't know about and just weren't uploaded to YouTube or posted to any social media platform, as these two were. We don't know the timestamp of video one. However, Devante did make a tweet on Twitter at 10.40 a.m. saying, quote, all right, one more, end quote. What he was referencing exactly, I, I don't know. Looking at this tweet, we can assume that he was still home since he was said to have left home sometime in the afternoon. If I had to take a guess and connect the dots, the tweet, all right, one more, was a reference to him making one more beat, as he stated in the YouTube short video. This is my observation with the relation between the video and the same day tweet. We have to remember that Marquita mentioned that her daughter, Devante's cousin, said that he left in the afternoon. The video had to be made that late morning, just as the tweet was made at 10.40 a.m. Now, on to video two. All right, so I had to upload this beat and go get ready to see Kanye. So here's what Devante is saying, quote, getting ready to upload this beat, then go get ready to see Kanye, end quote. This video was the follow-up video to video one, which was uploaded on what seems to be the same day. To analyze both videos further, if you remember in the timeline, this is on the same day that he left in the afternoon and told his cousin he will be back, and his grandfather witnessed him getting into his Jeep. As mentioned, there was a bad storm in the DMV late that day. Devante was already on the road during the evening when the storm hit DC, and most likely got caught in it at some point throughout his trip since he had to travel through Pittsburgh area, and from weather archives that I pulled, they too did have a thunderstorm, around the time he would have been in Pittsburgh. The video seemed to have been some form of update. Why was he giving an update? I don't know. I don't know if it was just happenstance or there was more to it. I say that he was just making content and sharing. He was updating social media and YouTube wasn't excluded. Remember, we were all in lockdown and a lot was going on online. I don't think there's much to it, but in retrospect, it tremendously adds context to how he was, his demeanor, and what he was doing hours to minutes before his trip to Kanye. One might ask, did he even know Kanye West? And what did he mean when he was saying that he's going to check on his friend Kanye? The videos, in my opinion, are odd. But the only way to consider them odd is to have something to compare them to. And that's something we just don't have. After these two mini vlog style videos were uploaded to YouTube, I did confirm that he did upload beats, just as he said he would, and to his BeatStars platform for sale. I can't provide a timestamp because it's unavailable front-facing, but there were a total of three beats uploaded on Thursday, July 23rd, and the latest two are titled Kanye, I Know God Breathe on This, and Kanye, 12 Acres. Remember, July 23rd is when he started his trip. If you ask me, Devontae was a huge fan of Kanye, and that's where you think it started and ended. But this trip says otherwise. The last and final tweet he tweeted that we can see today was to an artist named Santiago. At 7.12 p.m., Santiago's tweet said, quote, Can't be me. Produced by me. Midnight? Y'all ready? End quote. This was him sharing that he has a new single and was planning to release it at midnight and asked where his friends ready. Devontae replied at 10.15 p.m., which stated, quote, Man, I'll do it right now. Keep playing, end quote. This tweet response is confusing because that response is saying that he will do it right now. My question is, do what right now? The artist was saying that he was dropping music. At this time, Devante was already on the road and a few hours in. It's an odd reply and I can't make much sense of it. I don't even know if I'm supposed to make sense of it. Something just seems off. 
Either something was off or he was just trying to get noticed and garner attention because he had a skill that any artist could use. This would have been a 12-hour span from his tweet that morning. The trip. The trip itself is a large part of why this is a confusing case. I want to make it clear that as far as we know, no one else took this ride with Devante. It was only him. We know he had to make some type of stop to get food, rest, use the restroom, and even pass through toll booths, which is something very important that has not been mentioned. And I'll explain why shortly. Some rest stops were closed or operating on limited access due to the pandemic. A nearly 30-hour drive taken by oneself, straight through, is very hard on the body physically and mentally. The brain itself can go into mental exhaustion by sitting in the same position too long or simply being behind the wheel for extensive hours at a time. He would have had to go to the restroom. He would have needed to eat and to get gas. Due to it being in the height of the pandemic, there was not a lot of traveling since many people were in fear of their health and safety. There was just a lot going on in the country. Traffic wasn't bad, but any human would need to take a break from driving. Law enforcement, according to what has been publicly shared, has not shared any prior known locations of Devante except for his Jeep being found on the Hall Road. The McDonald sighting. I came across a Facebook post on the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office Facebook page that was made on Wednesday, July 29th. The post was said to bring awareness to Devante being missing and his missing persons flyer. On that post, there is a comment shared by a young lady named Molly, according to her Facebook page. Molly shared that she may have seen Devante in a McDonald's drive-thru on Tuesday by himself. The Tuesday that she was referencing had to be on Tuesday, July 28th. She could not have been talking about the previous Tuesday because that date would have been Tuesday, July 21st. And as far as we know, according to family and law enforcement, he left home on Thursday, July 23rd. The McDonald's that she was referencing is located at 2005 17th Street in Cody, Wyoming. Cody is the location for Kanye's first ranch and only 15 minutes from that McDonald's. This sighting is unconfirmed, but she said it was after nine and dark out. Molly also stated that the individual she saw seemed okay physically and only seemed tired. This could be a missed sighting or there could be something to it. The easiest way to know would have been to review the camera footage and local street cameras. We don't know whatever became of this. This is interesting because that would mean Devontae did, in fact, make it to Cody if that was really him in the McDonald's drive through After Thursday, July 23rd at 10.15 p.m., there were no more tweets from his account. No more uploads of beats any day after. No more tweets. No more calls. And he was already reported missing. His vehicle was photographed on Wednesday, July 29th by law enforcement. Now, how did his vehicle end up nearly an hour away in Greybull? Well, Kanye has another ranch in Greybull, which is in the vicinity where Devontae's Jeep was found. It was around 10 to 12 miles away from the Jeep location. I don't know which address he entered into his GPS, the Cody address, the Grey Bull address, or both. I say both because at that time, Kanye had both properties. If Devante did not know Kanye personally, then he may not have known which ranch Kanye would have been at since the sole purpose of this trip was to, quote unquote, help his friend Kanye. So therefore, he may have entered in both addresses into his GPS. I assume the Grey Bull address was last since it was in close proximity to where his Jeep was last found. If who Molly saw was actually Devante, then she would have remembered because he is Black, and there just aren't a lot of Black people in Cody, under 1%, and he had DC plates. There is still a high possibility that it may not have been him. If he arrived to Wyoming sometime in the evening of July 24th, then her alleged sighting was on July 28th. That's four days he would have been unaccounted for while in Wyoming, assuming he drove straight through with minimal stops. Then, I look at our timeline. His vehicle was said to have been reported on July 27th along the dirt road. The timeline is filled with skepticism because the date he was last seen is incorrect on some of the flyers that I've seen. If that reporting is true for July 27th, then there is no way that could have been Devante and Cody at the McDonald's. 
is either the timeline is flawed and her sighting was correct or her sighting was incorrect and it wasn't Devante. We're piecing together a puzzle at this point. Toll booths. I have something better for you. Check this. When I think about toll booths, he would have had to encounter them at some point. There are always cameras there, so surely his vehicle had to have been seen through multiple toll booths if he did in fact take the toll roads. Some states that he may have traveled through did not and does not contain toll roads, but the ones that do would have picked up his vehicle for multiple reasons. Another element that we need to analyze further because I want to open you up to consider something. I also wonder if law enforcement ever considered this. If you remember, in 2020, many states removed their toll booth collectors from booths because of COVID. What would happen is you would still have to pay the toll, but you would be billed instead of your cash being collected. Of course, if you have EasyPass, SunPass, or FastTrack, your payment would be charged electronically. The bills would come a year or two after the trip. This could have been because of the backup and limited staff. I know from experience, as I was billed in 2022 for a 2021 trip taken, no matter if it was interstate or intrastate travel. I can strongly and confidently assume that because toll collectors were not present in the booth, Devante was sent several bills to his registered address on Mississippi Avenue for him to pay, just as several thousands of Americans who traveled. My next question is, were those cameras ever checked? Why couldn't law enforcement or the family backtrack from those toll locations and check with local gas stations, restaurants, hotels, and rest stops to see if Devante stopped in? Sure, by then it would have been quite some time in between from when he went through the toll booth to the time he received the bill, to the time they checked with local locations, but it would have been an opportunity that could have gave some answers. Camera footage would have been gone, but perhaps an employee could have remembered something or crossing paths. The toll bills would have included a date, timestamp, a photo of his Jeep, and the license plates. See, here's the thing. The most vital element to this mention is that by him receiving the toll bills, they would have seen an estimation of exactly how far he drove, the timestamp of when he reached that location, the ability to see if he did stop somewhere, and possibly the silhouette of only one body in the car or two. Who collected the bills that he would have received in the mail? And if they weren't paid, then what is the status of them today since he is now on record as a missing person? and may have accumulated a citation for non-payment if no one paid them. This is a huge and valuable mention. Why hasn't anyone brought this up? Sick. I've read comments about Devante possibly contracting COVID at some point, got ill, and that somehow led to him going missing. This element isn't too far off. It's, it's possible, but I disagree that he went missing due to him being sick. When I look back at the YouTube Shorts videos that he uploaded, I do wonder if that was his regular speaking voice. To me, he did not sound sick, but I also never heard Devante speak outside of that video. From the interviews I've listened to, no family member, his aunt Marquita and mother Miss Harvey, have not said anything about his voice. So I believe that to be his normal tone and speaking voice. When people bring up COVID, it's not unheard of that he could have contracted COVID at some point throughout his travels. He was said to have been a Lyft or Uber driver, so he most likely came in contact with several people in such close proximity that could have been carrying the virus and he contracted it. Now, Uber and Lyft has suspended service for some time due to the pandemic, and I can't find a clear answer as to when it resumed service. Marquita said he drove for one of the companies, but I don't know how close to his trip he did drive as a rideshare driver. If you notice in the YouTube Shorts videos, he was in a mask. It is assumed that he was at the home he shared with his mother. I'm unsure of who all resided at the home and all of who were present on the day he left. This is another element that I can't get a clear answer on. One thing I do know is he was uploading beats because you clearly see the screen through his glasses. Wherever he was, he had his laptop and phone his laptop to make and upload beats, and his phone to record his YouTube shorts videos. It's not off the table that he could have contracted COVID throughout his cross-country trip. You can't convince me that this man did not stop anywhere else besides to get gas, not once, 
to use the restroom or get something to eat. I believe cameras picked him up, him or his vehicle, but there's just no public record of it today that we know of. And it could be that law enforcement is holding this close to the case. That is a possibility. The whole point of bringing this up is that some believe he was sick on the road and something happened. This could be true. There's just nothing to prove that right now. If you had COVID and was symptomatic, you know that it's similar to the flu, but much worse. The body aches alone is enough to keep you in bed. Now, if he started experiencing symptoms while he was driving, I don't know how far he would have gotten. This is only mere speculation because we don't know what his health condition was while driving. I can say that if he was driving with no help for extensive hours at a time, he would not be well physically nor mentally. If he did have COVID, why was his vehicle parked in such area that is miles off-road? The account always tells the story. I had this thought, and I'm sure you did too. I wonder where his bank accounts checked. This is an easy starting point, but could have been overlooked or not even looked into. We have to remember, Devante was unemployed and collecting unemployment through either DC, Maryland, or Virginia. This is dependent on the shopper's location where he worked. Devante's mother, Miss Harvey, stated that he was receiving unemployment benefits since he was let go from work due to the company closure. His benefits would have been sent via direct deposit or a government-issued debit card that is issued by the Department of Employment Services to receive his benefits. Because it is highly likely that he had direct deposit with shoppers to receive his paycheck, then it's not too far off to say he was receiving his unemployment benefits by direct deposit as well. This is, of course, if he filed for his weekly benefits in order to receive them that week. I wonder, was his bank account checked? because it would show which purchases were made in the leading days up to and during his trip, which would give insight to where his card was last used. And realize I didn't say his last location, but the location of where his card was used, because we don't know if he was the one using his card. Maintenance. Something else came across my mind. I wonder when Devante's vehicle was last serviced. This may seem minute, but this is vital because taking a trip like this requires a healthy vehicle that can withstand such long drive. I wonder when his last oil change was, and did he get one on the road? Did he have car trouble at some point? And what about his tires? It's just not being talked about. The reason I wonder this is because it will give an idea of what went on during the trip. If he did have to get his car serviced, this may show on his bank account whether money was withdrawn on his card or if his card was used. You can imagine that taking a trip at this distance, one could encounter several issues. His engine could overheat, issues with tires, an oil change depending on the last time he received one, and oil leaks. There has been no mechanical issues reported from that of his vehicle. The vehicle found. According to Marquita, Devontae's Jeep was found in the direction of him going home. When you're in the middle of vast land, what is the direction of going home when you're nearly 2,000 miles away to go home? I think what she meant was that his Jeep was facing the wrong way on the dirt road. The vehicle was on the opposite side of the road going towards traffic. The vehicle claimed to be found without gas, key in the ignition but not turned on, in great condition for it to have been driven cross country, and there was only his laptop and two cell phones in the Jeep. Let me say, I don't believe there was just his laptop and two cell phones in the Jeep. Maybe that is what is being communicated by Bighorn County PD, but there has to be something else that was there. You would think that there would be a charger or two, one for the phones and one for the laptop, napkins from fast food while on the road, something. I know you're thinking about the cell phones. Marquita stated that he had two phones. It's unclear why he had two phones and if both were turned on and active. We know one was new because he texted his father on his birthday, the day he left D.C., but there's no further mention on the other phone. I say that because the father, what has been reported, he did not know who the text was from, so he didn't respond. There just seems to be some details missing. I feel that there is something else. A vehicle that drove across country is found in a remote location, then out of gas, no driver, and the cell phones and laptop are left behind. 
I can understand the laptop, but the phones? I'm not sure why one would leave them, especially in a foreign environment, in the middle of nowhere. The gas tank was said to be empty, and the condition of the battery was never made public. This would offer insight into if the car was running then eventually ran out of gas and led to a dead battery, or the car was turned off because it ran out of gas. I conducted the research on a 2016 Jeep Compass, and it is true that in order to start the ignition on that model of the Jeep Compass, you would have to manually insert the key into the ignition versus different makes and models where you had the keyless startup using a key fob. The thing that this case is lacking is that we don't know the exact time that the Jeep ended up in the last spot. I can assume, based on what Angela said, which I cannot confirm if it's factual, which is important in any case, but she said that she was contacted by someone on their way to work about the vehicle and the license plates. The context is confusing when you play the recount. It seems as if someone contacted Bighorn County PD to inform them of the vehicle, then someone else contacted her on their way to work to notify her of the vehicle. Because the Jeep was on a mine road, it could not have been there long. It seems as if he possibly arrived in the evening, early morning, while it was dark outside. The area where his Jeep was, it would have been complete darkness. Now, the question then leads to, how did he get off the main road and into the hall roads? There is signage, but again, we don't know Devontae's state of mind and how cognizant he was. The sighting. Some reports, including the FBI flyer for Devontae, say that on July 26, Devontae was spotted at a gas station and a witness saw someone who resembled Devontae and said that he got into the passenger side of his Jeep and a white female entered into the driver's seat. Now, this lead is groundbreaking because it can mean that he did come in contact with someone at some point during his trip. We don't know if this person was someone who he was scheduled to meet, had been in contact with, or someone he knew or a complete stranger that he took a trusting in. One way to find out if this did happen, and if it was, in fact, Devontae, would have been to check camera footage at the gas station. This sighting was said to have been 150 miles away from where his Jeep was found abandoned. If this woman did enter into his Jeep, then where would she be driving him to? He got out, entered into the passenger side, and they assumingly drove off just to have his Jeep found abandoned the next day. This is a witness sighting, so it is unconfirmed. This could be a totally different person that wasn't even Devante, or it could have been him. If this is the case, then where would they have gone and what was the reason for him allowing this woman to become the driver of his vehicle? Was she with him for a large part of the trip or did they just meet at the gas station? Did she promise to drive him somewhere for something? This lead is the biggest lead in this case, but yet it still seems that it's a dead end. It seems to be a dead end because there's no follow-up publicly, and we don't know if that was in fact Devante. The numbers game. As I was constructing my notes for the analysis, I noticed something that was consistent. It could mean something or all of nothing. When you look at his Beats catalog, you will find that the price for his work is at a premium. Devante has some great work, and you can see and hear that he was skilled and talented in what he did. The prices for his Beats are $7,777 for basic licensing and $8,888 for premium licensing. Now, I'm not into numerology or anything like that, but I had to see the significance of these numbers because it's just not common for products or services to be priced in such way. When you look at those numbers, you will find it odd. The number seven, according to the Bible, means completeness and wholeness. We may associate the number seven with a full complete week. The worldly meaning is having intellect and wisdom to a higher place. For number eight, according to the Bible, it means new creation, a resurrection, and a new beginning. The worldly meaning is transformation, material and financial gain, and power. I don't believe he chose these numbers by happenstance. They can give insight into where he was mentally. No, I do not believe he drove this distance, left his Jeep, and started a new life. I, I just don't believe that. Devontae had confidence in his work, and I can tell by the pricing structure. This trip, in my opinion, was a trip of hopes and dreams. Big dreams. And then, it could be something like this. 
just being near. I've considered that Devante may have wanted to feel a sense of closeness to Kanye. Hear me out. Here's an example. If a celebrity dies in a hotel room, that room number is usually public record since the police report, autopsy, and other reporting details are public or can be accessible to the public. Fans will intentionally book the hotel room to fill a sense of closeness with the celebrity. This is why when you hear of celebrities transitioning in hotel rooms, the hotel staff usually changes the room numbers around to avoid a particular room from being repeatedly booked or requested for that very reason. The fan may visit certain locations that their favorite celebrity, alive or deceased, had visited. This could be what this was for Devante. Not proven, but it's something that is a thought of why he would have taken this seemingly spur-of-the-moment trip. The what if. I do wonder where his GPS was taking him. Angela stated that law enforcement was able to see that his GPS record does show that he was en route to Kanye's Grey Bull Ranch. Again, not factual. If he did make it to Kanye's private ranch, then what? If he would have arrived successfully, then what would Devante had done? Do you follow me here? If Kanye did not know Devante and he had shown up to his private property, you can only conclude that this would not have been well received. Showing up to anyone's home unannounced is in poor taste. But for a stranger, a fan, to arrive, this can be a safety and security issue where Kanye could have felt threatened and him or his security would have taken action. We can't ignore that maybe Devante did make it to Kanye's property and then something happened. Bighorn County PD claimed that they did follow up with Kanye's security and they said they never seen or know anything about Devante, nor has anyone shown up to the ranch. That's just what we have to go off of. Could this be a lie? Sure, it, it can. It could also be the truth. Devante could have been heading towards his direction, but somehow took a wrong turn and ended up on a haul road unknowingly. Kanye's Cody Ranch was 50 to 60 miles from where Devante's Jeep was found and where he was said to have possibly been spotted at a Cody McDonald's. And as I've stated, Devante's Jeep was found in Grey Bull. He was quite the distance from Kanye if that is where he was planning to go. Of course, if he was going to the Grey Bull Ranch, then he was only 10 to 12 miles away. But to the Cody Ranch, it would have been about an hour away. The Dangers of the Desert Let's just assume that he did get lost, exit his vehicle, and walked into the desert and then something happened. This is not too far off, as it is a possibility. It's possible that his Jeep ran out of gas. He exited the vehicle to walk to locate the main roads to get gas or seek help and something happened. Whether he came in contact with someone, wildlife, or something happened where he succumbed to the elements. If that were so, then there would be something to suggest that. The only thing with this is that law enforcement in Bighorn County claimed they did an air and ground search and found nothing. If he succumbed to the elements, a deceased body can't hide itself. Sure, we have to consider wildlife, but there is typically something that would have alluded to that or some form of attack by an animal since it seemed to have been only days since the car was seen and reported from the time it may have been driven or brought there. He could have been mentally exhausted at this point because of this extensive drive he just took. Devante could have been dehydrated. We just don't have anything to point us in the direction. If you look at how vast the land is, you would understand that something could have been missed or he may never even been in the vicinity. Law enforcement did say that they don't believe he is not and was not within a six mile radius of his vehicle. This could mean that they don't believe he was ever there. His Jeep was, but he wasn't. My opinion. This case is probably my most convoluted case, and I have a lot. The thing is, we simply just don't know. There's just not much to go off of since there really isn't anything solid. It's a case of opinions without much public facts. Without solid public facts, it's difficult to create a scenario. I've listened to the interviews of those who are close to the case, and I just can't figure this one out. I would be lying if I said I believe Devante's case received the attention it needed, because it didn't. I do believe there was a missed opportunity very early on into the investigation. It's a strange case. If a crime was committed, it was clean cut. Again, this is based off what has been stated publicly. 
Who knows? There could have been things there that allude to it being a crime, but it could have been clouded over. Let's start from this. The mysterious sighting of the woman entering his Jeep on the driver's side and him getting into the passenger side. I can't confirm if this was actually Devante. My first thought is that he may have been set up, catfished. He could have been too trusting or this could be irrelevant and not even him. When I look at where his Jeep was found and the location of Kanye's Cody Ranch, they were an hour apart. The location in which his Jeep was found on the Hall Road, as mentioned, is used for mine trucks to access. Locals know these roads are back there and not commonly used for normal traffic. Was his Jeep driven there and left or was it driven there and planted? This is something I cannot figure out. Sure, if we all had the answers, then perhaps this case would be solved or have some clarity. I don't know if law enforcement did all they could. If I were to look at this from law enforcement's angle, if everything is forthcoming, they really don't have much to go off of. They would have probably had to wait for the public to come forward if all leads and search efforts have been exhausted. But I do believe, again, there was a missed opportunity. I was shocked to hear that the family has not been to Wyoming. I can't say as of recently, but at the time of the interviews, referencing in 2022, the family has not been to Wyoming. Two years after he went missing. Just like the saying goes, if you don't do it, then it won't get done. I believe someone should have went out there to see for themselves. Something could have been missed or more could have been done. No, I know family is not law enforcement, but this is their loved one. I would have liked to know that they were there in Graybull, seeing what was done and be involved in the search. Even Devante's vehicle. The vehicle, according to the DC side, MPD Commander Daniel Godin, in a 2022 interview with journalist Chandrea Thomas, he did state that the case is still open and that they have been working with the Wyoming police. He also stated that there were no tips as of lately. One mention that I thought was odd is that Commander Godin says that Devante's vehicle, according to Wyoming police, says that it's with the family. Well, Marquita says that they don't have the vehicle and don't know where it is. With that, where's the vehicle? Why is Wyoming saying the family has it, then DC saying Wyoming said the family has it? But then the family says they don't have it and don't know where it is. There's a huge disconnect. The family never went and picked up the Jeep, so they don't have it in their possession. I'm not even sure if they were informed to pick up the Jeep after it was processed. I believe there is more to the vehicle, and without it, it's another missed opportunity. This is heartbreaking since the vehicle is a large part of the investigation. I've even considered that maybe Devante was catfished. Who was he speaking to privately online that could have connected with him and created a false illusion that they knew Kanye? I just don't see someone selling that type of package to Devante. If he was catfished, then they could have had him catch a flight and not drive. Most people aren't willing to take a drive like that. But then again, it was a pandemic and who knows how far some are willing to go to catch a break. When I look at the tweets, then the tweet to the artist Santiago that was unrelated to the post saying, quote, man, I'll do it right now, end quote. Both tweets were unrelated to the post that he was replying to. I just can't put my finger on it. I don't think he knew Kanye or anyone in his camp. I believe Devante was a fan, someone who wanted to work with Kanye and develop a personal or business relationship with him. Could he have taken it a bit further and took this trip with some mission in mind and he encountered someone with bad intentions? Or did he take this trip and became somehow disoriented, dehydrated and confused and something happened, not by the hand of someone else, but succumbed to the elements? I believe he did take the trip and something happened. What happened in between? It's just unknown with the truth because I believe there is more to the story. Whether someone else was involved or not. The thing that's odd are the sightings, the vehicle looking as if it were dumped, and just the trip itself. If that McDonald's sighting was him, then where did he stay for all five of those days after he left D.C.? Can we really be for certain that he did leave D.C. on Thursday, July 23rd? Without seeing those toll bills that came in the mail, I can't know for sure when he did leave because those toll bills would give the full story regarding his travels. Gosh, they, 
They've really dropped the ball on this case, my God. Even his Jeep, law enforcement claimed there was nothing else inside. No food bags, no wrappers, nothing. He could have stopped and threw out the trash in the car that he accumulated, but typically one would do that at a gas station or wherever they make a stop. But his Jeep was said to be out of gas, so it appears that he didn't make a stop for at least 284 miles. The fuel economy on a 2016 Jeep Compass is 284 miles. That is about four to five hours of driving time and largely dependent on your speed. That is a very long time without stopping. You would think if he did make a stop to throw away trash in his car, there would be some footage of that somewhere. We can't forget about street cameras. His Jeep had to be picked up on camera at some point. The population in Great Bull is around 1,700 residents, with the primary race being white, followed by Hispanic, then less than 1% of residents that are of two or more races, Black or any other race. I'm not even confident that Devontae was ever in Great Bull. If Devontae was there, he would have stuck out. I don't know if he had tent on his windows, and I don't know if he made any stops in Wyoming near the area of Great Bull or in Great Bull. It is believed that he arrived at night, which if he did, then no one may have seen him making him go unnoticed since people may have already been in their homes. Remember, we were in a pandemic. I do believe someone out there knows something, whether they're involved or not. I don't know. If they're not involved, then why wouldn't they come forward? Who would they be protecting? If no one is involved, then where is Devante? Whatever became of him? Why is there no trace evidence? Was there trace evidence and it's being concealed or just missed in the search? If there's nothing out there, perhaps Devante was never there and his vehicle was placed in that spot. Again, assumption based on public details and not factual. Law enforcement did state that he was never in or is not within six miles of his vehicle. So what does that mean? Is there someone else involved? I think we all can agree that this case has many questions that lack the answers and a story that you try to piece together, but it's unusual. When a case like this goes cold, time just keeps moving. Time separates you from what happened, but your heart is still there, stuck in a time of uncertainty, thoughts of what happened and filled with unanswered questions. I don't believe Devante's case was taken seriously early on because of the Kanye reference and the fact that a fan made an attempt to see a celebrity, then somehow goes missing. We know he took the trip. We have an idea of where he was going. What happened in between is a mystery. Angela made a reference that was shocking, but I'm not surprised. She claimed on the Ick and Mel YouTube channel during her interview that while they were doing a search for another young woman, Officer Tony Giles joked that Devante is probably in a concrete pillar on Kanye's property. This is just to give you an idea that this case may not have received the proper coverage and attention it should have, if that statement she made is true about Officer Gals. Until people start talking, if there's even someone else involved, because there's a possibility that there was no other person, a case like this won't see answers. I would hate for this family to go another year without knowing. There was a missed opportunity in 2020. We need answers because I would hate for a case like this to remain unsolved and freezing cold. Just another best kept secret of what happened in July 2020. I want you to do your own research and formulate your own opinion. At the time of Devante's disappearance, he was 28 years old, stood at 6'1", and weighed between 165 to 175 pounds. Devante is an African-American, has brown eyes and black hair. Devante has a medium brown complexion, mole on the right side of his face under the bottom lip. Both right and left arm sleeve tattoos and blue tattooed across his left knuckles. Devante was last seen wearing a blue shirt gray sweatpants, multi-color New Balance shoes, blue do-rag, brown and black bag, and prescription sunglasses. 
His vehicle is described as a navy blue 2016 Jeep Compass with license plate number GD1855. Devontae would typically go by D-Rich or Blue Theory as he publicly referenced himself online. Devontae would be 31 and turn 32 this year on June 9, 2024. If you have any information or leads in the disappearance of Devontae Richardson, his current whereabouts, or any information concerning Devontae, it should be directed to your local FBI office. And I've included the link in the show notes or description box. You can also contact Detective Matthew Botko with the Metropolitan Police Department in D.C. at 202-763-9938. And lastly, you can also contact the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office at 307-568-2324. I thank you for your viewership of Devontae's case. This one was tough because there are many possibilities as to what happened and the timeline is spotty. Like with every case, this analysis is to bring awareness that we have a missing person. Just like with all of my other case analyses, I conduct them with respect, grace, and consideration. I will always state the public facts, but I always will consider who's watching. I know this can bring anxiety to families by seeing their loved one's name on a video, which is why I'm careful with my words and my intent is always pure. My purpose is to ensure that their name stays in the media rotation to potentially help spark one's memory and let those involved in the family and friends of our missing person to know they're unforgotten. We'll always have a place here, and we're still looking. As always, I ask that you be respectful in the comments and think critically before you comment negatively. Remember, this can happen to any of us, and I'm only doing what I will want done for me, and as you may want done for you. Take care of yourself, be safe, be vigilant, and always be aware of your surroundings. God bless you. Do not fear, because I am with you. Don't be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will hold you with my strong, righteous hand. Isaiah 41.10